Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on calcium signaling. In this video, what I want to talk about is store-operated calcium entry. Store-operated calcium entry. And uh, store-operated calcium entry is usually abbreviated to S-O-C-E. So if you see anyone uh, using that acronym, uh, you now know what it means. S-O-C-E, SOCI, um, uh, means uh, store operated calcium entry. Now, confusingly, there is a whole other uh, there's a whole other name for store operated calcium entry, which is that it's also known as capacitative calcium entry. Capacitative calcium entry, um, and that's usually abbreviated to CCE. Uh, for short. Okay, so whenever you hear someone talking about store operated or capacitative calcium entry or SOCE or CCE, uh, it means this. And now what does it mean? Well, basically, when we stimulate the GQ pathway, we cause release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticular stores. So from the intracellular stores, we are going to release calcium. So calcium is going to come out of the intracellular stores, like so. Okay, and um, now when the calcium goes into the cytoplasm, the question is, does it all then get transported back into the stores afterwards? So you move loads of calcium out from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. Now, does all of that calcium that you release from the endoplasmic reticulum then make it back into the endoplasmic reticulum? Well, the answer is no. A lot of it does, so quite a bit does, but then some of it also gets extruded from the cell. So after, when everything is finished, afterwards, you're going to have overall less calcium in this endoplasmic reticulum than when you started. Okay, now if that was allowed to continue, what would happen is that the endoplasmic reticulum would eventually run out of calcium, basically. Calcium level would go lower and lower and lower, and eventually we'd um, run out of calcium. So what you need is a mechanism for refilling the endoplasmic reticulum when this happens. Okay, and that um, entry of calcium where we take it from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm and then into uh, the ER, that mechanism is known as store-operated calcium entry or capacitative uh, calcium entry. Either of these refers to this movement of calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum when endoplasmic reticular stores go down. Okay, uh, so if we were to stimulate the cell with histamine, and measure calcium concentrations in the cell. So if on this axis we plot calcium concentration and on this axis we plot time, then initially when we stimulate the cell with calcium, uh, sorry, with histamine, it will activate the GQ pathway and you'll get intracellular release of calcium. So you'll get a calcium spike. But afterwards what you'll get is this sort of tail off here. And this this sort of long-term rise, that is because of the calcium being moved through the cytoplasm continuously from the extracellular space into the endoplasmic reticulum. And that basically is the store-operated calcium entry here, or the capacitative calcium entry. And if you remove all extracellular calcium, so if you put this cell in a medium that contains no extracellular calcium, then basically, uh, this entire pathway is going to be in vain because there's no calcium in the extracellular fluid, so you're not going to be able to move it into the cytoplasm and then into the ER. So what you see instead is you see the um, internal, internal release of calcium from the intracellular stores remains the same, but then this store-operated calcium entry, that's just gone, basically. That tail of the graph is gone, and if you remove all extracellular calcium, this graph would look just like the calcium spike that you got from the intracellular store um, transient release. Okay, right, so that's what store-operated calcium entry is. 
we are now going to look at the exact mechanisms underlying uh, this graph here, basically. So we're going to start with stimulating the cell through with histamine. We're going to look at the GQ pathway. It's all good revision. We'll see how uh, calcium is released from the intracellular stores. We'll see how some of that calcium is reuptaken back into intracellular stores, while some is extruded from the cell. We'll then see the mechanisms uh, that the endoplasmic reticulum has uh, for recognizing that calcium is too low, and then activating some sort of channel in the cell membrane uh, to open and allow calcium to move through from the extracellular space into the ER to return the calcium levels back to what they should be, basically. Okay, right, so let's start off with uh, histamine then. So if we take a little piece of this cell membrane here, so let's say this is the cell membrane, and let's say our cell has histamine 1 receptors. So the H1 receptor is a G protein coupled receptor which is coupled to the GQ heterotrimeric G protein. So this here I am supposing is the H1 receptor or the histamine 1 receptor. Right, so when I uh, put some histamine on this H1 receptor, uh, it's going to bind and it's going to activate it. So let's briefly go over the structure of histamine, because it's a, it's a nice, simple molecule, and it's based on, obviously, the amino acid histidine. Okay, so um, histamine... Um, Firstly, it's based on the amino acid histidine. So, in fact, let's start off by drawing the structure of histidine, and then I'll show you how you get from histidine to histamine. So, um, if this is the amino group of the amino acid up here, then this is the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off that alpha carbon, and down here is a carboxyl group. So, we're drawing histidine at the moment, the amino acid histidine rather than histamine, but histidine is basically just um, um, just the carbo histamine with the carboxyl group, or rather histamine is the histidine molecule without this carboxyl group. Okay, then what you have is a, a methylene group like so, and then what you have is a um, five-membered ring known as an imidazole ring. So, let me show this. You have carbon double bonded to another carbon, and then the two group, uh, atoms over here are nitrogen atoms. Now, one of them is then doubly bonded to a carbon, and the other is singly bonded. Now, this basically is the imidazole ring. So, when you have nitrogen double bonded to a carbon like that, that double bond there is known as an imide bond. When you have nitrogen double bonded to carbon, it's known as an imide bond. So that's why this is called the imidazole ring. So let me write that down. Okay, so this entire structure here with the uh, this five-membered ring, this is called the imidazole ring. Okay, so the imidazole ring. And you see it a lot in uh, biochemistry. It's uh, used in the purine organic basis, so it's in guanine and adenine, uh, and here it is in histamine and histidine. Now, of course, this isn't finished at the moment, because, you know, these atoms haven't got enough bonds, so this carbon needs to have a hydrogen there, this nitrogen needs to have a hydrogen, and this carbon also needs to have a hydrogen. So that's the complete imidazole ring. Right, so there's the structure of histidine. Now, if we want to turn it into histamine, all we do is remove this carboxyl group so and replace it with a hydrogen, basically. So this below here is the structure of histamine. So there's the amino group. Here's this alpha carbon with a hydrogen off, and now it's got two hydrogens. So instead of having that carboxyl group, which makes this an amino acid, it instead has a second hydrogen. Then you still have that methylene group exactly the same, and then you have this imidazole ring. So these two carbons here double bonded to one another. These two nitrogens coming off like so. The imide bond to this carbon here. And then just saturate it up by binding hydrogen to anything that has a spare bond. Okay, so that there is the structure of histamine. Okay, and it's basically just the decarboxylated version of histidine. 
Okay, so basically, what's going to happen is that histamine is going to come and bind to the H1 receptor and cause activation of that H1 receptor. Now, the H1 receptor is coupled to the GQ, uh, heterotrimeric G protein. So, here is our heterotrimeric G protein. And if it is a GQ heterotrimeric G protein, then the alpha subunit is set, basically. Uh, if it's GQ, it means that the alpha subunit is alpha Q, okay? So, no ifs, no buts, it's alpha Q. The beta and the gamma subunits, these other two subunits that make up the heterotrimeric G protein, there is variation in what they can be. There are five different beta G, um, subunits that can be used um, as the beta subunit in a heterotrimeric G protein, and there are 12 different gamma subunits you can use. So there is great um, scope for variability, basically. But if it's a GQ, heterotrimeric G protein, then it means that the alpha subunit, at the very least, has to be a fixed alpha subunit, i.e. it's the alpha Q subunit. So that makes this the GQ, heterotrimeric G protein. Now, when the heterotrimeric G protein is in its inactive state, then the alpha Q subunit has bound to it a GDP molecule, standing for guanosine diphosphate. Okay? And... Um, and uh, basically, when it's inactive, either it can be physically linked to the inactive H1 receptor, so there's a physical bond between them, or uh, the uh, inactive GQ heterotrimeric G protein can be bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. So, whichever of those situations it is, uh, the het inactive heterotrimeric G protein will be close by the uh, H1 receptor, basically. So, when histamine comes along, binds to the H1 receptor, what will happen is the H1 receptor will become active and the enzyme, uh, enzym enzymatic reaction which it catalyzes is the breaking off of this guanosine diphosphate molecule from the alpha-Q subunit and the binding of a GTP molecule from the cytoplasm onto that alpha-Q subunit instead, basically. So what you do is you take the alpha-Q subunit here, you cut off that GDP, and instead you bind GTP here. So GTP is bound to the alpha Q subunit. Now, the uh, beta and the gamma subunits, uh, once the alpha Q has bound its GTP, so, uh, GTP molecule, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit. So the beta and the gamma subunit go off on their own, own little adventure. So the alpha subunit cleaves off when, once it has GTP bound, but the beta and the gamma remain together, and they're henceforth referred to as the beta-gamma subunit. Right, okay, now, once you um, have created this alpha-Q GTP subunit, so this is often referred to as alpha-Q with GTP bound to it, once you've created this alpha-Q GTP, uh, what does it go and do? Well, it goes and activates another enzyme in the membrane of the cell, basically. So, let's draw this. So, let's have an enzyme here. Okay, so it goes and activates an enzyme which is in the membrane of the cell, and this enzyme is known as phospholipase C, and it's specifically phospholipase C of the beta type. So this is phospholipase C beta. Phospholipase C beta. Right, okay, so alpha-Q GTP comes and activates this enzyme. And once you've activated that enzyme, what it begins to do is it starts to uh, catabolize or break down uh, a component of the phospholipid bilayer. And the component which it starts to break down is a molecule known as PIP2. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.